afternoon, everyone. And today we have Ms. Wilhelmina Kisun Singh, the Director of Agriculture from Turks and Caicos. And she's here with us today to talk about the importance of extension in sustainable agriculture. So how are you doing today? Hi, good day, Adam. I'm fine. Thank you for having me. And, and I would say welcome to the beautiful <laughs> islands of Turks and Caicos. Um, but you're not here physically, but you know, uh, we have technology which would bring you over to us and me over to you. So thank you for having me today. All right. That's no problem. So the first question I'd like to ask everyone is, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about the background in agriculture. Well, I am in agriculture more than 34 years now, working in, um, in agriculture. I started off as an extension officer um, with the government of Trinidad and Tobago in one of the more rural areas of Trinidad. I um, lectured at the University of the West Indies in agriculture extension and food security programs. I also worked in the private sector with agriculture input supply companies. I've worked with the government of Dominica. I've worked with Jamaica. And I am here back in Turks and Caicos for the second time, working for government again in the area of agriculture, mainly in policy development and legislature um, to help move a country that is a tourism-based country to one that would be hopefully doing more agriculture. So you look like you have a whole wide range of expertise. So that's, that's great. So, so the first question I'll ask you to work with governments, I mean, this question would definitely um, apply to, especially to what you do, is that, you know, how can interdisciplinary frameworks integrating like scientific uh, innovations and using multi-stakeholder perspective be designed and effectively applied to sustainable agriculture systems? As you know, um, agriculture is a very challenging field. It is dynamic. Um, every day we have new issues to address in agriculture. So there's a new pest, a new disease. There's issues of climate change and the problems they bring with flooding in some cases, drought in other cases. Um, we have all kinds of emerging issues surrounding agriculture. And I mean daily. It's a, a daily um, you know, um, thing that you have to deal with. And so therefore, agriculture research and extension systems are central to unlock the potential of agriculture. Innovation through research can address many of these challenges that agriculture face. But in a lot of countries, especially developing countries, research institutions are underfunded and under-resourced. And the extension systems are also underfunded and under-resourced. And so it is important then to have what we call the interdisciplinary framework. There's the terminology now called agriculture innovation system. And the idea is to bring all institutions together who have resources that can deal with a particular issue. And we come together to address the common issue. So we basically combining resources to deal with issues as they occur. And so money doesn't go and resources of all kinds doesn't go to one area and then to another. And I know it's a haphazard thing. It's basically everybody working towards one cause to solving one problem to solving one need. And that is really important now. Yeah, I understand that because collaboration is a key and collaboration makes a, well, as they say, teamwork makes a dream work. You yeah, know. and networking, sharing is, is essential to that, you know? Right, right, exactly. So, so you mentioned institutions. So I'm, I'm kind of assuming here you're talking about um, basically universities and private institutions, right? So um, I would say, you know, since agriculture is a highly knowledgeable or highly intensive um, kind, of, um, kind of work, and it's definitely guided by institutions, um, what we what do you can you suggest any like novel um, extension strategies you may have tried or you have seen done and how they could best um, set up to facilitate institutional change and the technical innovation which you were talking about with the aim of ensuring the widest number of farmers are reached and most importantly uh, although they reach 
they are engaged because some farmers don't really engage in most of the most of the trainings and stuff like that. So agriculture is very knowledge intensive, you know. Um, farmers have to be, I, I say farmers wear many hats. They have to be a soil scientist, they have to be an agronomist, they have to be an engineer, um, they have to be a geneticist, they have to do marketing, managing, everything. And related to that is the information that goes with it, you know. Um, we have a lot of now, we have knowledge management systems that exist. The Food and Agriculture Organization, they have something called TECA, T-E-C-A. It's an online platform that gathers successful agriculture technologies and practices to facilitate knowledge and exchange among farm families. So basically what it is, is a platform where farmers are able to share information and experience and where they, ask, where they basically say, okay, they tried this, it worked for them, or they tried that, it did not work, and they're able to share information. And researchers and policymakers and everyone else is also able to share and gather information from farmers. And these knowledge management information platforms are really key to not just information sharing, but information management. There's a really good example that exists in Egypt. It's called Vulcan. And this is a virtual extension and research communication network. The aim is to harness the potential of the internet and apply it to strengthen, um, strengthen basically outreach to farmers. So it links research and extension, and it, it is basically geared to providing information and support to Egyptian farmers and then reaching on the ground to these farmers and letting research know what the problems the farmers are having and letting policies makers know what the problems farmers are having so that it can be addressed. And then of course, you know, in the US, we have the land grant system where, you know, um, we, the universities basically address system um, needs that farmers have and try to do research geared to those specific needs within the community that the um, university works with. With all these, there are some challenges. In, in the Caribbean, where I'm from, um, it's much smaller and we can engage on a more one-on-one -on -one with farmers. But as you know, farmers are widespread, wide you know, geographically, and we have those that might not be able to be reached, but we now have what we call the ICTs, and I'll talk about it a little bit more, the information communication technology that now allows us to reach persons that are you know, geographically unattainable to reach. And so we now have to harness these knowledge management, information management systems and make it work for us and you know, apply it to what we do. That's interesting because I always believe, you know, I mean, since in my entire career, <clears throat> I always believe that research should definitely be geared towards what the farmer wants and what the producers want. You know, we should be geared into solving problems because, I mean, I understand, you know, there's a whole different, um, I wouldn't say natural, but a whole different section, which is like, like genomics and stuff like agriculture, which is great. I mean, the work being done there is great. But I think that, you know, to, um, some of the farmers who definitely need the help would not be able to understand those kind of techniques. You know, they, they, they want very simple and practical um, solutions to most of their problems. So, I mean, that's just my opinion um, on things. But um, as you mentioned, technology, right? Um, these days, you know, if you look at, especially in the U.S., a lot of um, watering crops and plants and stuff like that is actually, you know, could be controlled by an app on your phone, right? Mm -hmm. um, it could be controlled by web-based technologies. Do you think, you know, um, for example, like, you know, how much kind of agriculture, uh, agricultural education or extension could actually empower um, farmers to adopt this type of technology? Sure. So there's this, the business of what we call e-agriculture. And there's the whole thing on e-agriculture, e-agriculture extension, and it's the global community of practice that facilitates dialogue, information sharing, and ideas through the use of what we call ICTs, information and communication technology. And 
you it, there's a range of things from crop advisory, payment systems, linking buyers and sellers, even reality TV for agriculture in yeah in some of the Asian countries, um, advisory text messages, WhatsApp group, online learning platforms, apps as you said. Um, the ICT applications, they say, are cheaper than face-to-face -face, um, because they are cheaper than traveling to reach the farmers and then you can reach a wider audience. Um, they're also more timely and regular in providing advice to farmers. So, you know, a farmer send a text message or a farmer send an email and you're able to respond or through a phone call compared to you have to go travel to the farm and then meet the farmer and respond to his problem. Um, they rely mostly on SMS and audio elements. And um, they we call them basically low-hanging fruits okay. um, of extension advice as they are not location-specific and not client-specific. There are a few ICT applications aiming for what we call the higher hanging fruits and your um, audience can probably read about some of those tools like iCow, which is used in Kenya and it provides livestock keepers with cow tailored advice. Um, studies have shown that ICT extension based systems have some positive effects. Um, it, at the end of the day, we have to remember about who provides the advice and who provides the information. Plays a key role because farmers' decision to take up an advice is based on trust. And therefore, if they know who is giving the advice, farmers tend to adopt the advice more quickly, you know? And um, what, what else did I say? So it must be trustworthy. Um, the other thing about the use of ICTs that we're seeing is that it creates what we call peer extension as a new term, um, PWER extension. It means that now through social networks like um, Facebook, et cetera, farmers are able to now talk to each other. And there's this new type of extension emerging where farmers now talk to each other and give each other advice. And farmers tend to take advice from other farmers because right. they do that. This is someone just like me who understands what I am going through, who faces the same challenges of weather, high cost of inputs, um, disease, pests, whatever. And therefore, this person would have tried something that might have worked for them. And therefore, I can take this person's advice. Remember that thing about trust? Right. You know, uh -huh. better than, say, someone who sits in an office. And is giving me advice, you, you know. Right, right. <laughs> we have um, a good example of that is um, something called uh, a Facebook group called Small. Um, I think it's called uh, Small Scale Farmers, where over four hundred thousand farm farmers are reached worldwide, mm -hmm. and they share information and discuss the challenges and opportunities. So, ICTs definitely um, is is the new extension tool that is being used and there's unlimited less potential to its use. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I would tell you that, you know, I'm trustworthy source, especially into, <laughs> in today's world, you know, anybody can read anything on the internet and become an expert, you know, but if you actually practice it, and yeah. get it out, then you could offer advice to people. So that's, that's, a, that's something to think about necessarily where you're getting your, your information from. That's why extension is so important, you know, um, because extension technically is supposed to be from reputable universities or organizations. And so, yeah, you know, that's how it started 1800, in the 1800s, you know, through the potato um, light farming that took place right. in Ireland. Right. And farmers were faced with, you know, the potato fields dying and it was causing huge economic loss to Ireland. And so the universities, you see, this is where the, the whole link comes in. The um, universities at the time looked at how this problem could be solved and they had the information and now they needed to share that information to the farmers. And right. that's where the terminology extend, extension came from. It's extending that information now to the farmers. So, yeah. So 
So, so let's, let's let's switch gears a little bit. Let's let's um. So we talk about you know farmers and stuff, but we, we never really talk about funding, you know, uh, in terms of because all of this to get all this out there, you know, requires you know money, right? And mm-hmm. there was some funding and stuff like that. So my question to you is that you know, um, which models and mechanisms for private sector uh, funding or even um, co-financing of extension and advisory systems? Have more successfully reach farmers if you just if you have if you just take out the public sector extension services, if you know you just remove the government sectors. Um, what mechanism do you think you know could reach successful successful farmers? So as you said, we have basically two main categories of service providers: mm-hmm. extension service providers, government and non-government organizations. Yeah. Now the let's. The government organizations, as we stated earlier, um, have the issue of funding. Funding is a, is a big issue. And they, apart from funding, it's the, well, lack of resources on the whole, but also um, it tends to be bureaucratic and it tends to address, slow to address farmers' needs simply because um the process of extension officers being able to keep up to date with new technology and new techniques of doing things to be able to address farmers' problems is an issue, right? So now then we have private sector stepping in and we, because the private sectors are stepping in and there are all different kinds of players in the private sector now offering extension advice, we call that a pluralistic extension type system. So these private sectors do fee leveling, fee leveling, um, and that's progressing slowly. And um, we also have like associations and cooperatives and societies existing as well. That's being married into this whole private sector um, extension. Now it's linked to basically supplying of inputs, you know, um, and there's no single um, agriculture service provider agency that caters to all the needs of the farmers. Now, um, what happens is that is still no guarantee for inclusion of smallholder or marginal resource farmers. That's still a problem, you know. And um, but private sector extension is is being increased, and you probably heard the the terminology on contract farming. This yeah. is an area where private extension is, is used and is increasing, and it's a vehicle for agriculture extension. Um, so companies deliver information with the sale of their inputs or the marketing of their product. So in other words, you have to use my product and my inputs in order to get the advice. Right, so yeah. it's linked that way, you know? Mm-hmm. And with contract farming, it's not just my inputs and my advice, but it's also my market. Yeah. And so that whole thing about private extension through contact track um, farming is, you know, um, uh, an area that is um, gaining a lot of momentum. And I can give you some examples. So like in India, um, they're tending a lot to go in this direction of private extension. And there are many private companies that work in extension in India. Um, A good example, and why is this a good example? I I, I would say because it's a unique example. You know about franchising in the US, you have McDonald's and and, um, Starbucks and you know, and you see the reach that franchising has. So this company is called Tata Chemicals Limited. They started off in 2002 and the objective of the company is to provide that kind of um, technology information and advisory service to empower farmers and through providing agriculture inputs. But they operate like a franchise where they have a hub and a spoke model. Now the hub is a resource center. It supports 20 to 25 franchise outlets. And then each outlet caters to 30 to 40 villages covering approximately 13 miles. So presently they have 32 hubs and they cater to around 22,000 villages reaching over 3.5 million farmers. So they have this model 
where they franchise agriculture inputs and the information that goes with the inputs. And they use a, a model similar to franchising in the US to now share um, this information. And this is how they go about doing private sector extension. And with it, they now funding is no longer an issue because it's now um, operated like a business. So you buy my inputs, you get advice. It's a service that is offered when you purchase. You know, so farmers think and the perception is I'm getting free advice, but at the end of the day, it's not free. It's because right. you bought some things from the company, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah, so it's like... It's like, it's like, it's it's like you're buying a fridge and they come to set up the fridge in your home. Yeah, and you're like, wow, good technician. You know, I got free setup for the fridge. No, you bought that, yeah. you know? The yeah. boiling the, the initial cost of it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So we're gonna look that up and, and, and read more about that. Um, yeah. so my other question would be, you know, being being a woman in agriculture, because I was talking to one of my friends who's also an extension um here, and she was saying that she wasn't getting the response, you know, that you know uh, other male extension officers might have get. You know, so my, my question is, and I always like to ask, you know, my, my, my female interviewers this, is that, you know, what are, are the most effective approaches, you know, for retaining women in research and extension systems and ensuring that they are fully designed from, actually from the design of the research and the extension systems, bearing in mind that it will meet both the gender specific and wider needs. So that's just a question, you know, as a as a woman, we would actually want to hear from you considering that. I'm going to smile because, um, <laughs> you know, women, we run things, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I see that because it's becoming true. Meaning, um, when I started off now, so that's 34 years ago, um, when I studied and it was a living institution, a two-year program to do a diploma in agriculture. That's how I started off my career. Mm -hmm. A class of 32 had six women. And we were, it was persons from all around the Caribbean in that class. And when I started to work for government as an extension officer, I was the first female extension officer in that particular part of Trinidad and Tobago. With that came um, many challenges. Main one being um, earning the respect from farmers who were mostly male themselves, right. um, you know, and farms were owned by male, um, now taking advice from this little young girl, you know? And you had to work triply hard compared to the men um, who would walk onto a farm the male extension officers and the farmers would listen to them. The advantage to that, however, was that um, farm wives, the, the wives of the farmers, who were mainly the decision makers, right? Um, now, like the fact that there were female extension officer to now get information from, they felt more comfortable dealing with a female extension officer. Fast forward now um, to the, my, uh, then in the, in the ministry, throughout the Caribbean, most of the directors and heads of um, the different groups within the ministry, the different sections within the ministry of government were male. Fast forward 32 years later, I just came from the ministry in Trinidad and there were 12 departments and 11 departments, the 11 directors were female, one male. It was a total switch around. And then when you look at the university enrollment um, in schools throughout the Caribbean that offer agriculture, it's now a lot of females that are entering. And there are a lot of female extension officers. And then if you look at research institutions that offer agriculture research, there are now a lot of females. Now, why is this so? It's simply because it, there's a lot more equality when it comes to pay and compensation for work done and jobs. And because that is um, 
evolving and, and there's equal, what we call equal rights and equal opportunity, we see more females entering. And as more and more females enter, we mentor other females. Um, we work together and you find it encourages other females to come in into the sector. And because we have now also a lot of female farmers and you know, it is encouraging female researchers as well to help address some of the issues. If you look at the equipment and stuff that previously we use on farms, it was geared more to men operating and using. And it's nice to have female researchers now looking into what a, a woman might use versus what a man might use. And, you know, coming up with, with research that is geared to more female oriented. So I hope that answers your question. And, oh, and oh yeah. Yeah, that's the answer. It's perfect. So my last question to you, what, what I want to ask is that, you know, um, you know, we have a lot of young people that think, you know, agriculture is just going in the hot sun and planting a plant and that's it, right? Because there's so many different avenues um, you could take or you could in different types of careers for agriculture. So what, what advice would you give like a young person, you know, who, who is willing to study sustainable agriculture or even start an extension career? So I always tell people this, it doesn't matter whether you're young or you're old, if you know you can make money off of something and you show something is a lucrative business, people will get into it. That's number one. So it's about the money. You have to show that there is a career in agriculture. And then um, you have to show, now to encourage people to learn and study agriculture, institutions like yourself, and uh, yours and universities have to now modernize the courses that they offer, the agriculture courses. It can't be same old, same old way of learning things and doing things. As we spoke about earlier, ICTs, for example, is big now with agriculture. So your courses have to show these new technologies that are being used. And when you show in your courses that you have these new technologies, you will encourage people. Now, Agriculture is now marrying a lot of disciplines, you know? So you might have a tech guy, what we call like a little computer nerd, who now can re be in agriculture and the agriculture field because he has to see that the tools that he has and the things that he likes can address agriculture issues. We also need to offer more scholarships for agriculture programs as well, you know? And then we definitely have to look to social media, to agriculture. We must have um, that facility for young entrepreneurs, to encourage young entrepreneurs. So things that affect young entrepreneurs, access to land, access to credit, um, how to start a business, those things affect young people. And therefore, if you address those things, when it comes to the agriculture sector, you will attract you know, um, young people. Now, for years, we both and I know agriculture is an aging sector. But I have to say, thankfully for COVID-19 pandemic, um, unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic wrecked a lot of, you know, um, a lot of the economics and, and, and the economies of a lot of countries. The resultant is that we had a lot of job losses and then food became scarce as well. And I think there was a better appreciation by people of the reliability of this food supply and how important food is and food supply. So what we saw is a, a lot of people moving now into the agriculture sector because they saw the precarious position that our food system is in. So the COVID pandemic awakened people's eyes to the importance of the agriculture sector. Unfortunately, um, young people don't have much access to jobs. Now, you know, when you look well, uh, across the board, a lot of people are not hiring. And because of that, people are coming into the agriculture sector. But we don't wanna be one of those sectors that um, is just because you're not getting a job in one, you should come into this. You know, we want to show that it is lucrative. Now. Um, one of the things, and uh, I wrote something down. 
which I wanted to say. Ah, yes. So branding and packaging of the agriculture is has to be different. Young people are image conscious and self-image is what we call a strong currency. So the persistent images that we associate with agriculture when you go on the internet is this labor intensive kind of thing. Yes. Um, somebody old that's struggling, heavy manual work, low wages, that would repel you. So we need to start rebranding and packaging agriculture differently to now attract the youth. And we need to put a different kind of image. So show a young person with a tablet in his hand, now controlling a field through oh. digital, using digital farming techniques where you could have automatically irrigate your field, where you could operate your tractor through remote control, where you could use drone to go and scout for pests in your field. You know, show that side and start rebranding in that way. Um, then we have to, as I said earlier, address the barriers to productivity, so access to information, um, finance, assets, labor, network. Show now where you can access information easier through the ICTs, through the information communication technology. That will make people be more interested in becoming an extension officer because they will know, well, hey, I love using technology. I can now give somebody advice and do extension through the use of technology. That's one way to attract a young person into extension, you know? And then we have to show that there are um, networks that exist and um, the whole idea of networking and you have support, I think, through a wider world, um, uh, colleagues around the world would attract young persons into agriculture and into agriculture extension as a field. That's just my two cents. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I agree with the, the I agree with most everything you say, especially the branded part. You know, we, we I mean, in advertising agriculture. I mean, if you go into Google right now and you type in agriculture and you click on images, you're going to see somebody with a tractor driving a tractor, and the person is much much older. You, know, you wouldn't see or farmer. Just or type farmer. farmer. Or farmer. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't you wouldn't see any like anybody operating like drones and anybody doing like the automated irrigation, automated fertilizer and stuff like that. So yeah, you're completely right about that. And that's mm -hmm. something um, we need to think about, especially for the future, because the, the age of the farmers in agriculture across the world, um, also mainly in developed countries, uh, they're getting older. Especially here in the Caribbean. That's a big problem we face. And this on my the island I live now. Turks and Caicos Islands, traditional agriculture here is done by the old people. Everybody talk about the grandmother and the grandparents and stuff. And trying to get young people into this sector now is a real challenge. And you have to show on this particular island, in this particular country, have to show there's money to be made. Once you show there's money to be made, and once you show that it can Yes, it might be a little labor intensive in some cases, but it's not that way in all. And there are new types of farming techniques. You know, you have freight farms, you have um, hydroponics, you have all kinds of stuff. Right, right. And you start seeing people's eyes brighten up a little bit. You know, young people like, <laughs> okay, I don't have to work 12 hours in the hot sun with right. um, a machete in my hand. And, you know, yeah. Right. Yeah, yes. that's, that's pretty that's pretty interesting. I like that. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mr. Sun Singh, for you know just giving us some of your time this afternoon to discuss some of the extension issues we have to the agriculture. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for having me, and I wish you all the best um, with your seminar conference um, that you're having. Um, and I hope everything goes well. And your students are welcome to visit the Turks and Caicos Islands at any time. You know? <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let them know that for sure. <laughs> I think about having a, a little field trip. <laughs> yeah, that's no problem. <laughs> All, All right. right. Thank you very much. Enjoy your day. You too. Bye-bye.